Hi, and welcome to lecture series 14. In this series, we're going to talk about four different topics. Uh, the first one is going to be about your emotional memories. The second topic will be about memories that are absolutely shocking. Um, those are known as flashbulb memories. Third, we will investigate the constructive nature of memory. And finally, we will talk about your memory for where you learned something. But let's start now with emotional memories. Emotions actually help our memory. That is, if you give someone a list of words and ask them to remember it, and some of the words are emotional and other words are neutral, people will remember more of the emotional words. And if you come back even a year later and test them again on the emotional words, you'll find that the effect, the difference between our memory for emotional and neutral words is even greater. Uh, some people think that the enhanced memory for emotional words has something to do with the consolidation process. Maybe it helps us consolidate information uh, more. We do know for sure that your emotional memories are associated with activity in a part of your brain called the amygdala. Now you can see the amygdala here. The amygdala responds strongly anytime you see something that's emotionally charged. It seems to be particularly responsive to anything related to fear. So what I want you to see in this picture is a man whose face is telling you that something very scary is in his line of sight. And if you can see his face and he sees something scary, oh boy, are you in trouble. You need to pay attention. Okay. What happens when you see a face like that or some kind of stimulus that's very fear inducing? Well, look at this brain imaging scan in the bottom picture here. And you see those two uh, round areas, small circles of massive brain activity. Those are the amygdala. So they're super responsive every time you see something that's scary. It's amazing how sensitive the amygdala are to fear. And I'm going to show you a study. It was a brain imaging study that has, I think one of the smallest manipulations I've ever seen. And yet it has a very big impact on brain activity. Uh, on the far left, you see two pictures. One picture depicts only the whites of someone's eyes. If that person is fearful, right? So when you're afraid, what happens to your face? Your eyes get really big. And so there's more eye whites around uh, the irises in your eye. If you're happy, your eyes are still fairly big, but it's not as extreme. So the amount of eye whites is relatively small. So what these researchers did was to create these eye whites um, and corresponding eye blacks, which of course doesn't correspond to the color of our eyeballs. Um, but to show those really small, stimuli to people in a brain imaging magnet. And what did they find? Well, <laughs> the amygdala responds, uh, what is that? Four times more strongly to fearful eye whites than to happy eye whites. And if you take the eye whites and turn them black, the amygdala doesn't care at all. So it's more response. The amygdala is more responsive to fear related stimuli than to other emotional stimuli. And it's very, very sensitive to the little cues that our face produces when we're afraid. Oh, and I should point out this. Another thing that was amazing about this particular experiment, the slides or the, the images that you see here, they were presented for 17 milliseconds. That's 17 one thousandths thousandth of a second. And yet you still get that big difference in amygdala activity. It's a phenomenal result. Okay. So the amygdala is important in our perception of emotions and our understanding of emotions, especially fear. So then you might say, well, that's correlational. How about something causal? How about, well, are there any people that don't have amygdala? And it turns out we know of one person. This is patient S.M. She lives in Canada, I believe. 
and uh, she has a rare genetic disorder that resulted in her being born without amygdala. Uh, patient SM who lacks amygdala has no fear of snakes or heights or guns or knives, um, and she cannot learn to be afraid. So this, this woman, you know, it turns out that fear is, is a challenging emotion to feel, but when you don't feel it, it's a very big problem. So patient uh, SM, walking home late one night from work, crossed through a dark parking lot and was mugged there. Now, if you were mugged late at night walking through a parking lot, the last thing you would do the very next night would be to walk through that same parking lot. But that's exactly what patient SM did. Patient SM has been held up at gunpoint, at knife point. She almost died in a domestic um, uh, violence incident. Not being sensitive to fear is a very bad thing. Um, well, those are just anecdotal evidence. How about something experimental? What I'm showing you on the left here are pictures of different people expressing different emotional states. So the, um, let's say the woman in the upper left-hand corner, she looks angry. The fellow in the top middle, he looks scared. The woman in the far right in the top, she looks disgusted. So you can look at these pictures and easily say what emotion they are expressing. That's those of us who have an amygdala. How does patient SM do on the same task? Well, it turns out she's pretty good on all emotions except for one, fear. She cannot tell you reliably whether a frightened person is experiencing fear. In fact, a, a number of studies have been conducted with patient uh, SM, and another one is shown on your right. So it might be hard for you to see, but um, on these two uh, pictures right here, you can see some fine lines. And what those fine lines tell you is, if you show a picture of a fearful person to me or to someone else who has amygdala, what do we do? We immediately pay attention to their eyes, which makes lots of sense since the eye white study we just talked about, right? So we just focus in on those eyes. Maybe we'll look down at the mouth, but there's a very sharp triangle of places that we look. Compare that to the two squares to the right of it. Those are the eye fixations and eye saccades of patient SM as she's looking at fearful people. And you can see, I mean, she's looking at their nose, maybe a cheek or a sideburn. I mean, she's not zeroing in on the eyes. Uh, and there's a great picture on the far right up here that shows you the hole in patient SM's brain where her amygdala should be on each side of her brain. Okay. So you might think, well, let's put this all together. Do I need my amygdala to detect fear and maybe equally importantly, remember fearful things? Well, there was an fMRI study that was done that confirmed just that idea. And in this study, subjects watched little movies. Half of them were neutral you know, maybe you talk about washing your car, going grocery shopping, and half of them were emotionally charged um, scenes, basically violence, uh, de depictions of violence in movies. And subjects were later asked after they saw these um, short uh, movie clips to recall as much as they could about each of the movies. And what they found out is that people were better able to recall information about the emotionally charged movies than they were about the neutral movies or unemotional movies. And even maybe more importantly, when these people were in the fMRI, right, in brain imaging magnet, they showed increased amygdala activity. So when you combine all those findings together, what you can conclude, what many researchers have argued, is that you must have an intact amygdala 
in order to acquire and remember and express fear and fearful emotions and fearful memories. Okay. Now I said at the outset of this lecture that emotion helps you with memory. And by and large, that's true. But there are some cases where in extremely emotional situations, um, your memory is pulled in a direction that makes it actually harder for you to remember things. And what do I mean by this? Well, if I'm walking down the street and someone pushes a gun in my face and asks for my money, um, <laughs> that's an extremely emotional situation. And what we know is that there's a phenomenon called the weapons focus, the weapons focus. Basically, if you take a gun or a knife and put it in somebody's face, what are they going to pay attention to? Well, the gun or the knife, right? Because everything depends on what happens to that gun or knife. That's where my attention is. So because all of my attention is drawn to the weapon, after the crime is finished and you ask me to describe what the robber was wearing or what the robber looked like, I'm going to have very little memory of either of those things. So it turns out the presence of a gun during a crime dramatically impacts a victim's memory of the criminal, of the crime. And this is probably explained by something called the Easterbrook hypothesis. And the Easterbrook hypothesis says that if you're in a very emotionally charged situation, um, there's high arousal, you're really activated, you're in that almost fight or flight mode, it turns out that your window of attention, how far you can spread your attention across the scene you're looking at, that that window of attention narrows down right to the thing you're looking at. And that makes sense with a gun, right? If you put a gun in my face, my window of attention, which might normally spread my attention or resources all over my visual field, that window of attention is going to go whoop right to the gun. Um, those of you who enjoy baseball may have seen something similar. Um, when a, a ball is hit high up and far out into the field, uh, the people who have to catch the ball focus all of their attention on the ball. And what happens is if there's multiple players running for the same ball, they'll run right into each other, sometimes to the point of knocking each other out because all of their attention is focused on the ball. It's another example of the Easterbrook hypothesis. It turns out that the weapons focus becomes even more impactful if the gun that's seen at a crime is fired. You can see that in the graph below. It's from a 2000 study in which subjects watched a robbery that involved a gun. Half the time the gun was fired, half the time it was not. And you can see along the vertical axis they've plotted the percentage of details that observers or eyewitnesses to the crime could act accurately remember. And you can see that in each case, people could remember more about the perpetrator, about the victim, about the weapon, if the gun was not fired. If the gun was fired, in each case, memory dropped. 